Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, October 3rd, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate you doing that. All predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and that's going to be the focus of the show. Your, your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides, which is going to be mostly about the market. And then when we get to the live charts, we'll open up for individual questions. If it's something that requires a lot of thought, I'll give you a quick answer, and then I'll cover it in more detail in the next Q&A session. Now, we'll wait again, for, and this is for your benefit, wait till we get to the charts before you ask about individual stocks, and then you can ask about as many as you want, but also for your benefit, just make sure you ask about one at a time so I know which ones I've covered. So what are we talking about? Well, I think the elephant in the room is the market. So I think the state of the markets should be our focus today and winter watch returns. So the question is, is winter still coming? As I've said quite a bit, that bastard John Snow talked a lot about the winter coming and finally it did come, obviously. So, the question is, are we back into the woods in a potential bear market? Well, let's just take a quick little look at the 10% TFM system. And I've beat the dead horse this, horn this so much. I'm not going to go through all the details. Just know that we're looking to buy a market when we're within 10% of a 50-week closing high. And the last two lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. In other words, you have two weeks of daylight, and that's all there is for a buy. And we're going to exit when we're 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high, and the close is less than the 50-week moving average. We're not going to wait for downside daylight. So I updated a spreadsheet this morning, and to my surprise, it wasn't quite as ugly as I thought it would be coming into today. You could see that we're right at about 3%. And that's that's really nothing to get too excited about right here. We got about 3% in the latest buy signal, which is interesting. It triggered way back in March, as you can see over here. As I've said quite a bit, this isn't a system to trade in and of itself. This is just a tool to sort of help you gauge where the market is and what you should be doing. Now, according to this, this is still long. So this tells me let's not panic just yet, but as you'll see shorter term, there's a lot of things that have already sort of flipped the switch with me at least to put on some shorts and to be very skeptical on the long side. So kind of interesting that this system has triggered back in March and so forth. It's still long since March of 2019. We have 215 days in. Does that make sense? Has it been 215 days since March? I guess it has been. Okay, so that's, that's what I was looking at earlier. So that's what I found interesting is that this thing has been long for three quarters of a year and it's only up 3%. So you can see the market hasn't performed that well since the last buy signal. That This sort of dovetails in with the net-net movement that I talk about quite often. I did a show for StockCharts.com yesterday where I talked a lot about net-net. And those of you who are members of the website, my website, DaveLander.com, you know that that's something that I talk about quite often. So this right here tells you that obviously the market hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress in the last three quarters. And we're going into the fourth quarter now, only up 3%. That's one or two big down days away from being negative. Now, as I've said quite a bit, this does trade a little bit because it is a trading system, but it only did 10 trades in 30 years which I think is not too bad for a longer term trend following system. And then as I've said in many other prior presentations, the diaper change moments, this is how much losses you would have avoided by following the system. So obviously 
In 2000, the market lost about half of its value. NASDAQ lost 74% of its value or 70-something percent of its value. So following a simple little system like this would have kept you out of a lot of trouble. And then obviously, the bear market we saw back in 2008, the market lost half of its value and the system would have gotten you out long before that happened. So it lost another 52% after the system exited and it exited at a pretty good profit here for 48% of the last run. So the main thing that I've pointed out with the system ad nauseum is that it does help you avoid some pretty serious diaper change moments. Now, as I was gonna point out in just one minute, the last sell signal, the market dropped 11% from the sell signal and it kind of looks like a little bit of a whipsaw, but 11%, as I've said quite a bit, is nothing to sneeze at. You got a million dollars saved for retirement and it's still in the market and you lose 11% in a month or so, that's $110,000 you're going to be thinking long and hard about this stock market and investing, and you might have to rethink or begin rethinking your retirement if you're losing $110,000 a month. Now, this is what the system looks like over the past several years. The blue line is just the 50-week closing high. And notice that for the most part, the market has made higher highs and higher lows for quite a while until it started dropping, obviously. The green line is just 10% below the blue line. So the system goes short when you close below the green line and you close below the 50-week moving average. The system goes long when you have two weeks of Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than 50-week moving average, and you're above the green line. The green line is just 90% of the blue line or 90% of the 50 week closing high. The little histogram up here shows you that if you go above 10%, it means that you've dropped below the green line because you're more than 10% away on a closing basis from the 50 week closing high. Now, I didn't wanna talk too much about this because we did kind of talk about it quite a bit over the last year or so, whenever I discovered this. Now we did have one warning sign. You get a warning sign when you no longer have upside Landry light and or you are below the green line. The green line is 10% away from the 50 week closing high. So you can see here we did intersect the moving average. If you close below, the green line, which is 90% of the 50 week closing high, you're gonna get a warning. If you intersect the 50 week moving average, you're also going to get a warning. Now notice here that it intersected the green line and you didn't get a warning. Well, why is that? Well, because it closed above the green line, you're still within this sort of safe zone, sort of give the market the benefits of the doubts. And this whole, the whole genesis of this system is basic TA 101, basic technical analysis 101 states, if a market is at A and it's going to C and B is somewhere in between, it's gonna pass through B on its way to C. And as long as the market is near C, then the market is healthy. And again, give it the benefit of the doubt. So you can see we had a little warning back in 2018, and then we had another warning back last October, and then we had a bona fide sell signal. Why? Well, we closed below the green line, and we closed below the 50-week moving average. Now, it did pop higher a little bit before it sold off, and then now we had a neutral when things began to improve. And as I've said before, the cool thing about this was back in March, I didn't think this thing could ever trigger, at least not trigger for a long, long time because I was getting a little bearish. And one of you girls in my Facebook group pointed out that we had a buy signal. And I'm like, no, 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 
Stop being so bullish. Stop being so optimistic. <laughs> There's no way we have a buy signal. And then lo and behold, we did. So this is one little piece to kind of wake you up when things are improving or on the flip side, obviously, worsening. So that's the buy signal. And we've been long for 200 and something days based on this. And we did have a little warning in between. But we never did get below the green line, so it stayed as it stayed positive. There were no sell signals. I should say stayed in the buy. And then obviously this little sell-off we've had lately could be cause for concern, but right now we haven't gotten below the 50-week moving average and we haven't gotten below the green line. So as I've showed this quite a bit, this is what it looks like longer term. You can see your major bull and bear markets. It stays mostly green. And notice, and this is kind of an amazing thing to me, notice how it stays above the green line so nicely, keeping you long for these bull markets. And when it goes below the green line, not all the time, but sometimes, especially if it stays below the green line for a while, you could end up in a pretty ugly bear market now we did have a couple of whipsaw signals here and there and this last signal i've labeled it a whipsaw in previous presentations but i got to thinking about it this morning and it's like well i don't know 11 percent sell off after the signal like i just said that's one hundred and ten thousand dollars on a million dollars in an index fund that's nothing to sneeze at so i wouldn't rush out and call that a whipsaw I guess I called it a whipsaw initially because the market did go straight back up. But trust me, it won't always do that. And as I said quite a bit, the I picked up the truck from a different place this time. But last time I picked up the truck for my move, the guy I was watching CNBC, and I said, oh, I dabble in the markets a little bit. And he kind of rolled his eyes at me because <laughs> he obviously knew a lot more than I did. And... Uh, he said that he wished he'd have bought more. He's glad he, he he's glad he held on through December, and he wished he would have bought more. And I'm like, boy, that poor bastard. The market just trained him to be a very, very, very bad trader. And then again, we're back in the green mode. Now, Gary Culp um, calls the area between. I'll have to ask Gary to flesh this out a little bit. But he calls the area between the 50-week moving average and the 200-week moving average no man's land. And I guess his point is, is that the market just chops around and has a hard time finding its way. And we'll have to do some research on this just to see what happens when you're in no man's land. And it's probably when you're in there for more than a few weeks. But you can see here, this is a daily chart once again. We dropped pretty hard as of yesterday further into no man's land. And I guess the other thing that'd be kind of fun to do would be look for clear air above and clear air below when you're in no man's land, downside daylight and upside daylight respectively for the 50 week and the 200 week moving average respectively and see what happens. But we're definitely back into this chop zone or whatever you want to call. It. And I think that's, I'm assuming that's what Gary means by no man's land. So I just want to point that out. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting, getting back to a daily chart, we could end up with a second mouse type of signal in a bow tie. Now, we had this is a daily chart. And when you get a, a bow tie off of all time highs, or if it's pretty close, like we just saw, nearly all time highs, close enough for government work, squint your eyes and it's at all time highs. If I take my reading glasses off, it looks like we're at all time highs. That second signal can often be quite powerful. Now, second mouse simply means that sometimes that second signal works the, the best. The saying is the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. And sometimes your first signals can be a false one. Years ago, Kevin Haggerty, God rest his soul, he's a good, he was a good guy. Anyway, he told me that when he got a new kid 
in the trading room, they would only let him trade second signals. So he would have to bypass a lot of first signals and forego those trades. But the reason they only let him trade second signals was because a second signal tended to be more robust. They wouldn't happen as often. And you would, of course, miss a lot of good trades that happen on the first signal. But that second signal, again, would be a little bit more robust, a little bit more accurate. And uh, it would help that newbie gain a little confidence because he was trading more robust signals. So we could get a second mouse. As you can see, the S&P 500 bow ties have come together and could cross soon. In fact, I think as long as we stay around where we are, what could happen is we get a little bounce. Even without a little bounce, I should say, we should get a crossing, a crossover soon, and then the next bounce will give us the setup. And I, I think the point I was trying to make is that even if the market bounced a little bit, these moving averages will continue to catch up with the market as higher prices are dropped off and lower prices are added in. That's called the drop-off effect. Now, one thing I woke up thinking about this morning is what if I went back to the most recent market peak right before we got into this big slide and took a look at what my database was telling me at that juncture. And I thought it'd be kind of cool to go in and look at the archives for the service. So, and I'm gonna move these from where they are to uh, outside of the firewall, first chance I get. Usually I, I leave them on here for a couple of months and then I move them out where everybody could access them. So if you can't sleep at night, go in and take a look at these. I don't know the URL to this. When I edit the video, I'll put it in. It might be daveleonard.com slash archives, but I'm not sure. So I'll get that URL and put it in here. But what I did was I went in and grabbed the service for this day and took a look at my list. So this was September 12 here. And it was right at a prior market peak. And if you draw a line to the left, you see it's close enough for government work to a, a market peak. So at this juncture, we don't know if that's a minor double top or a more major double top, or if we should just give the market the benefit of the doubts. And that's what pretty much what the TFM 10% system does is give the market the benefit of the doubt as long as you are at or near, and near being 10% away from the 50-week closing high. Now, what I actually do is I do, I believe in a top-down approach, meaning market sectors and then individual stocks, but I do my top-down approach in a bottom-up fashion, meaning that I look through a couple thousand stocks to see what's going on, and then a couple hundred or like 250 or so, ETFs and sector funds and things like that. And sometimes I do a little bit more deeper dive than that. Other times I just sort of look at the major MIGs, meaning the major sectors and see what's happening. And I get a pretty good, good feel for that. And in doing all this, when I finally get around to taking a look at the market and doing my technical analysis there, when I look at a day like September 12th, where we're close to brand new highs, it's like, oh, well, this market looks like it's okay. But you know what? The database is saying something a little different. So I call that listening to the database. Now, there's not enough time today, but it would be a fun exercise. I know I'm a nerd. It'd be fun for me, but I don't know if it'd be fun for you. But if I'd actually go through the entire database and you would see short after short after short after short after short, you would get a feel for the database speaking. So if I go back in time and look at the Landry list, now remember the service that's done on 9.12 is for 9.13. So the Landry list will be 9.13. When you look at the archives, I have the date wrong in there, but this is what it's supposed to be. 913. The stocks are exactly 
the same. So I do my analysis, like tonight's analysis, today's the third, the Landry list would be labeled the fourth because it's a list for that trading day. Anyway, what's interesting is everything that has a check mark on it is a potential short. Everything that's not check marked or checked off or flagged, however you want to look at it, is a potential long. So the first thing that I'm seeing in my Landry list is we have quite a few more shorts than longs. Now, the nature of the longs is also kind of interesting. We see this ADC. Well, that's a REIT. Well, I don't, I haven't really studied REITs and bull markets and bear markets, but I don't think you need a bull market from a rally in the REITs, and it is just one, but REITs, often do well in a low interest rate environment because real estate is a leveraged sort of vehicle, sort of like the utilities. And then I see we've got a gold stock here. We've got another gold stock. We do have one little lonely retail stock. It's like, well, I'm not seeing a whole lot of stocks. Maybe this one could be the mother all setups but on anything less than fantastic because I'm not seeing a tremendous amount of long setting up and the ones that I are that I am so far have been golds and a REIT. Maybe I need to just sit on my hands for anything that's not precious metal related. And here we have another gold, another gold, and there's an the energy stock. Well, energies are commodity related stocks. So golds, energies, and stocks like that can rally independently of the market or can often go the opposite way of the market. There's another gold, there's another gold, there's another gold, and there's a silver. So there's another precious metal. And then down here, the XOP, which is the oil and gas exploration and production. So it's an ETF. And I just thought it was interesting. Looks like it had potential on the upside. Now, on the downside, we've got a biotech. We've got a tech consulting. I'm not sure how do you pigeonhole this area, but let's just call it technology related. You got a child care. I don't know how you quantify that or qualify that. You have a software. You have C&D packaging. That's consumer non-durables. And usually consumer non-durables can do okay because it's not as strongly tied to the overall market in, in a down market. But I guess packaging would be related more towards uh, big products or something. But I don't, it's not my job to pick it apart too much. Just kind of know what we're seeing. We've got a grocery store. We got health service medical instruments. We've got drugs, diagnostics. We've got health service medical instruments. And then software, 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 software. And then we have telecom. So we see a lot of tech as potential shorts. And we see quite a few drugs and health service related stocks and even more software related stocks. So this makes me think we might want to dip our toe in the water on the short side. We probably want to buy some golds or silvers, but especially golds. And we want to think twice about doing anything else. So if we fast forward to the current portfolio, which hasn't changed tremendously since the 12th. We did have one long, which was an IPO, but Dave, I thought you were feeling a little bearish. Well, an IPO could trade independently of the overall market, especially if it sets up properly, and that was INMD. And if you go to the Stock Charts channel, I did talk about INMD yesterday. I thought it was worth a shot. But you can see, looking at this portfolio, we are, long a gold, we're short a retail, and we're short a software. Now, the RUHN, that's an IPO, so I did like the setup there. As I preach, if things look an iffy and you think you have the mother of all setups, then go for it. I personally am also short 
NVCR, which was an honorable mention. It was, an, was not an official setup, but it was a stock that I mentioned as a potential short. And then also the TSCO, even though it's still short, personally, I'm actually out of my puts. I had puts, I played puts, I rolled puts, and then now I ended up out of them. I couldn't find options that I liked. And that's one of the dangers of trading options is that if the stock doesn't move within a given period of time, in this case it did, which was great, but I just didn't feel like spending a lot of money rolling these options out. So I rolled the dice on not following my own planning here. But I do work hard to take every single position that I mention as an official setup. Now, I'm also short PLAN, which we talked about in the Facebook group. And I'm also long AKG, which is another gold stock. Really hasn't worked out so great just yet, but it was a more of a kind of a penny stock and I figured it was worth kind of a gamble on that. So that's how the database shaked out. And this is how we played the latest slide. Now, I don't want to be smug, but I can tell you right now what's going to happen is people that know me, they're going to see me on, see me on the street, especially now that I'm back in the city. In the city, you go like, oh, Dave, how are you doing? The market's kind of crazy, huh? I'm like, I'm doing fine. <laughs> it's nice to keep your head while everyone else is losing theirs. And that's not to say that I didn't just go through a bit of a drawdown, and that always sucks. But the last few days have been okay in spite of the market selling off, obviously, because gold picked up a little bit of a bid. And we had pretty serious sell-offs in areas such as healthcare and software and pretty much everything else. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. So if you just use the concept of getting back to market timing, if you just use the concept of Landry Light in the 50-week moving average, you could see just that one little simple little silly indicator mostly long in bull markets and mostly short in bear markets. And you have very little red. You have to really squint your eyes. You had one or two weeks of red in here, but for the most part, everything stayed green. And what's fascinating is you look at the 2008 bear market, which, as you can see, went red in late 2007. And I, I always hate talking about this because a lot of people got hurt in that bear market but if you go in and look at the service archives which i think might be on that that url i mentioned earlier you'll see that we were heavily shorting in late 2007 and as i've said a nausea i actually apologize to my clients for recommending shorts when the market was near all-time highs it's sort of like the same thing that's happening now although i don't I don't know, or so far, I don't think we're, we're heading into a 2008 type of environment, but we'll see. But we had a plethora of sell signals on a daily chart basis, and then we actually had longer term, as I've said quite a bit, the bow ties actually were crossing over and triggering in late 2007, early, early, early 2008. So speaking of weekly bow ties, again, as I've shown this chart ad nauseum, we had major sales in 2000, major sales in late 2007, early 2008. We did have one whipsaw type of signal back in 2015, although the market did get pretty ugly back then, and I forget the exact numbers on the Russell from that signal, but I think there were close to 18% diaper change, which I think is significant. The media calls a bear market 20%, whatever is what I say to that. <laughs> but uh, fake financial news. Um, and we did have another sell signal last year, but it didn't trigger. So it's kind of interesting that the TFM system triggered, but the weekly bow tie actually never did trigger. So this one actually, in this particular case, had a little bit more lag. And then obviously we had buy signals major buys, meaning coming off of multi, multi-year lows, 13-year lows in 2009, and the S&P 500. So that helps you, the simple market timing, as simple as bow ties and the TFM 10% system are, that little simple market timing 
can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. I think the, I think the lesson 2.0 is to learn how to listen to the database and to go in and work your butt off every night, going on a little treasure hunt every night looking for setups. And while you're doing that, and here it comes, I thought I would do one presentation without saying it, but as Dakota once said, while you're doing that treasure hunt, make sure it's intuition you're feeling and not into wishing. There's been times when I can't find a setup to save my life and I spent a couple hours in front of the charts and finally I just give up and I feel a little deflated, but it's like, that's okay. Learning how to do that is probably just, import, just as important as learning how to find setups that you really like. Once you learn how to find the ones you really like, the hard part is sitting there doing all the homework and being, well, being willing to just toss it all out and wait for another day and then rinse and repeat. This was left over from last week. I got asked a lot of questions about trading psychology from someone who I believe is a member of DaveLander.com and what I would suggest they do in addition to everything we talked about last week would be to go in and take the mindset series course. And this is the beauty of this learning management system. If you say, Dave, I'm having trouble with my money management, and we go in a learning management system and you see you've gotten about 5% of the money management course done or completed, I should say, then we know, well, wait a minute, maybe you need to finish this course. And if you're still having troubles, then of course, ask questions. It will cover them in the Q&A. So become a member of the group. For those, there's a few of you still haven't joined the Facebook group that are gold members. If you're not a gold member, of course, you cannot be a member of the Facebook group that keeps the riffraff out. <laughs> but if you are a gold member, make sure you join the Facebook group. I had a couple of your older guys or, or um, refuse to get into social media. Well, just make an account up with a fake email and let me know that it's you and I'll be happy to let you in. You don't have to post pictures of your dog or your or whatever. <laughs> anyway, so join DaveLander.com. All right, let's pop out to the hot, the live, the hot charts, the live charts. And if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, please do so now. A couple things I want to flesh out. I guess I might have bragged too soon. It looks like my portfolio is turned the wrong way. <laughs> well, the market's rallying a little bit. That might be part of the problem. The market is oversold, and by the way, not the filibuster while we're waiting on this, but one of the things I was thinking about is on the short side, you do have to, you can't look the gift horse in the mouth when you've got a nice little sell-off. You have to be willing to go in and start covering before everybody and their brother starts covering. I mean, ideally, you want to be pretty close to your initial profit target, obviously. But the point I'm trying to make and something I've been thinking about a lot lately is you really don't want to split hairs that much on the short side, like I was looking for nine points, uh, actually 10 points on one, and I had like nine and a half points, and I figured that that was close enough for government work. Nothing yet, huh? Anybody seen anything? You know, it's weird. It's like, you know, that's the thing about Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome, but with computers, and programming and such, it seems like you could do the same thing over and over. Oh, there it goes. Finally, it woke up and you get a different outcome. All right, S&P 500, I, as I just said, my portfolio turned a little bit from this morning. I was doing pretty good earlier today, but you can see that it did turn around. Speaking of portfolio, let's take a look at those stocks before we pop into the overall market. So here's the portfolio, and then I'll punch up a couple that I'm actually long and short, respectively. This AUI getting a little, of a, bit, a little bit of a pop today. This was like a TKO way back in August. And you can see it's just kind of hadn't done a whole lot since, but it hadn't stopped the sale just yet. This PAGS was a short in here. This is a first thrust type of setup, very pioneer type of setup because you're very early in the rollover process. R-U-H-N was a little IPO. I just thought it was a beautiful little kind of Phoenix type of setup, kind of low level saucer handle. And we did have that 
on the day it triggered, I think it ran about 60%. So that doesn't always happen. Results not typical. You know, if it's like some of these scumbags out there, I should send out an email to everybody, make 60% in one day. It's like, <laughs> no, you don't, Danny. All right, track supply, you can see we've been short this one from way up here. I say we, I was short for a while via puts. And right now I have not reestablished my put position on that. I'm also got a little penny stock. I know probably shouldn't be messing around with penny stock. And I'm long this based on this last little pullback. And so far, it really hasn't paid off just yet. And again, as I said earlier, I'm short MVCR. And this is a nice little slide in here. This is a first thrust down. Got a little pullback in here. Nice little sell off. And then let's take a look at the bow tie moving averages. And you can see that yeah, it's a little, not quite a bow tie the way it's set up. Maybe technically it is, but I was looking more at the first thrust type of setup. So that's how we're playing it. That's what's going on. And as you know, I often don't talk about all the positions that are on, but I just figured in a market like this, you guys would want to see what we're doing and how we are surviving. Not that we always survive a sell-off and I guess the sell-off ain't over yet, right? Because we'll see, maybe, or maybe it is over and maybe the shorts will stop out. So be it, that's fine with me. One of the things that I did want to just kind of mention today is that on the short side, you're not really gonna get rich, but it does keep you in the game and you can make a little money when the market sells off. And as I often preach, the other thing it does is it helps you to see both sides of the market. As I say quite often, my friends who run hundreds of millions of dollars, but their charters are long only oriented, nothing wrong with that. But they tend to be a little bit always glass half full, even the market starts looking really, really ugly. Whereas if you short, you begin to see opportunities on the short side, and you realize that maybe you better honor your stops on your existing long. So I think that's the, the greatest thing about the short side is it helps you to see both sides of the market. I mean, I really do enjoy when, and I hate to say this because I don't seem like an a-hole, but I, I like when the market's coming unglued and I'm short and making money. It's a, it's a great feeling to follow your plan and to take those shorts and to take partial profits along the way. And everybody's freaking out and people are like, Dave, you okay? It's like, Dave's fine. Dave's fine, <laughs> okay? The market is following through to the downside. I love it. Now, it doesn't mean I love the market going down. I wish the market just always went up. But hey, we have to, we have to play the hand that's dealt. And now I quickly get over that smugness when the market begins to have a sharp retrace rally. And those really suck. Anyway, I've talked about that quite a bit. So maybe go to my YouTube channel, Dave. No, what is the YouTube channel? YouTube.com slash C slash Dave Landry and do a, a, a search on my channel for too short or not too short for a lot more details on that. If you're newer to trading and you want to try and decide whether to short or not. All right, S&P 500, we tagged this support down here. Let's see if we could get the... And some of these are programmed in with stuff that I don't use. 50-day moving average. There's a 200-day moving average. And let's add the 50-day moving average. The thing that's kind of cool about moving averages is, as I often say, a lot of technicals come together at the same point. And you can see right now the 200-day moving average is where? Well, it's just below where we are. And what's just below where we are? Lo and behold, this support over here. So we could probably grab this line. I don't know if it'll let me do it. But if we bring this line down, there you go. See, there's your support, there's a moving average. A lot of times, a lot of technicals come together at the same point. As I said earlier, borrowing a term from Gary, from Greg Moore, I'm Greg Morris, Gary Kaltbaum, is we are now in no man's land. We now have downside daylight below the 50 week, I'm sorry, 50 day moving average. So I would remain cautious as long as we're chopping around in here. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. 
NASDAQ tagged its 200 this morning. A lot of people are like, oh, 200 day moving average of support. Let's just buy it every time it hits it. Well, yeah, that'll work until it don't because sometimes it'll blow through it. Look what happened last time. Okay. You had a pretty serious slide. And if you held on after that slide, then you were pretty aggressive and crazy. I wonder what this line is. Something I tried to program a while back. I don't know what that is. I don't know if you can see it in your charts. So that's a NASDAQ. Russell 2000, the ugliest of them all. It's still down about three quarters of a percent today, even though I think the other indices, what did the piece do, or NASDAQ? Is NASDAQ now positive? Yeah, NASDAQ's now positive. I think the P's are now positive. Russell 2000 still down three quarters of a percent. Russell 2000 has now tagged the bottom of its range. As I've said a million times so far, take a look at a weekly chart. I wonder if we can go to like a nine day chart. You can see that so far, it's just a big picture retrace rally. It never did get back to new highs like the S&P 500 and NASDAQ or near new highs, I should say. And now it's down towards the bottom of that trading range. So Russell 2000, a little bit more indicative of what I've been seeing internally going back a month or so in the overall market. The energies tried to bottom out, as you saw in that Landry list from a while back. Luckily, we've had setups, but luckily they did not trigger, I should say, and that's been really crucial. We've been going after several energies as of late, and then they came off of the official list yesterday. Metals and mining overall has been looking pretty ugly as of late. Gold and silver hanging in there, though, and as I've been saying quite a bit, as long as we hold this little pullback in here, this little pullback will be an inflection point. You can see shorter term looking kind of toppy, kind of a minor head and shoulders type of top in here. But if we could bust through this little pivot peak in here, then maybe everything is just fine. So I hate to use the word hope, but that's what I'm hoping for because I'm long quite a bit of gold. As we go through these sectors, you can see that most of them are looking pretty ugly. Even food and beverage, which could, which could be a defensive area, sideways at best, recent little slide in here. One thing I've really been noticing is these financials have started to come unglued a little bit. There's the banks, there's research, research, there's insurance and real estate hanging in there, but it's hard for me to get excited about an area like real estate. It just kind of grinds along. And the problem with real estate is, or any other lower volatility area, any other area that's lower in volatility, is that you could still have a black swan type of move. Drugs wide and loose and sideways at best. Yeah, um, keep the, um, start asking about individual stocks if you want to, keep the picks coming. Health services, as you can see, breaking down, and that's why I ended up short on the NVCR. Even some of these areas have been doing better in here on a relative strength basis, such as defense, are beginning to break down. And this is why it's a little dangerous to go after the last of the Mohicans. Let's say the overall market's starting to look iffy, starting to look sideways, and then you have an area like defense that looks okay. It's like, well, if the market does sell off in earnest, because it looks like it might just do that, do we have to worry about the bigger they are, the harder they fall? And that could be the case. Manufacturing breaking down. M and C kind of hanging in there, but that's another one of those areas that do you really want to be long that last strong area? Leisure breaking down, retail now beginning to break down. And again, we had that one setup that I didn't take in Costco. Why? Well, I guess I just wasn't nuts about the setup, but also the fact that retail was the last of the strong areas. And I was maybe a little worried, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And so far it's beginning to roll over. Now, especially retail. Diversified services, this one's hard to figure out because diversified services could be a little bit of anything, but it's rolling over. Transports got absolutely creamed the last couple of days and now finding a little bit of support, but looking ugly at best. And you can see software now beginning to break down. 
little classical ana technical analysis 101. We have a possible head and shoulder top in the works. I look at classical technical analysis, but I don't trade off of it. I'd rather use something like a bow tie to give me a trigger. And lo and behold, we had a bow tie trigger right here. And then that happened before the head and shoulder completed or appears to be completing itself. Chris says it's tough to find longs, ITRI, so so setup. Yeah, we'll get to that one. But yeah, it's really tough to find longs. And, and so you, you're kind of reiterating my point. If you can't find a long and save your life, then maybe don't trade the long side and just listen to the database. You can see semis are all over the place. Looks like they're trying to roll over once again, wide and loose, sideways at best. Also a possible triple top in the works. Telecom, eh, just hard for me to get excited about something wide and loose like that. Now, internet, I think there's a few bad ticks in here, so let's just forget about that for now. But internet in, in general, not doing so great. Utilities doing okay. Well, why is that? Well, it's probably because the bond market has ended higher and higher in here as a general statement. Now, for the aggressive, tomorrow might be the mother of all opening gap reversals. Eat your Wheaties and get ready for an interesting trade tomorrow. If we see a big gap higher in here, this kind of has a gatekeeper look to it. It's kind of a retrace rally that stalls out. So if we have the mother of all opening gap reversals tomorrow, coming tomorrow, futures are up big, futures being the stock futures are up big, and then the TLT gets a big pop on the open for whatever reason. I guess futures down would push it higher. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. Bonds and stocks are now a tricky relationship. And it, it seems to, it only works when it works. As a general statement, bonds should go up while, stock, while stocks are going down and a little bit of vice versa. It's very hard to make that intermarket technical analysis work. But let's just focus on bonds in and of themselves. Big gap open tomorrow. We could have a nice potential ogre trade. Let's take a look at the dollar. Hadn't looked at that in a while. You can see the dollar in general remains fairly strong. And this might be why my gold stocks are just underperforming and not kicking butt they're vacillating between a small loss and a small gain on those okay chris says it's tough to find setups but let's just take a look at itri anyway uh it's a little on the thin side but not too thin for an individual trader when you back the chart way out i would toss this stock out because you're just kind of bumping up against these prior peaks in here okay but if you zoom it in, I certainly see what you are looking at. And Chris knows what he's doing. You can see it's a nice little trend higher, fairly persistent, nice little pullback. A little wide and loose here and there, though. And the more you back it out, the more wide and loose it begins to look. But I would pass. And you also, again, have to factor in the overall market. I'm never really sure where to put these scientific and technical instruments. That's one of those, it's like diversified services. Can you really call that a sector? I don't know. MRNA. Uh, I think it's pulled back maybe a little too much. Let's back the chart way out. I think this is a newer issue. Yeah, that's an IPO. Let's zoom it in now if we can. It looks okay, but it may have pulled back a little too far. I'm gonna give that an okay. Um, any more slide would be too much. It's let's let's measure this move and see what that is. It'd be cool if we could measure from the low, but let's just see. Yeah, it's a 50% move, so it looks okay. Maybe around 16 would be an entry on that. And then maybe way down here would be your stop, looking to capture a major, major bottom. So I think Donald, given current conditions, I think you probably found one of the few possible setups out there. I'm not going to go after this one, but I hear you, and it's it's not bad. You can certainly do much worse. All right, any more? I appreciate everybody hanging in there with all the technical difficulties. It looks like everybody here is a friendly. <laughs> I know I would have left a long time ago. This guy didn't know what he's doing. Well, the go to webinar software was 
a little hokey today. So I got to figure out what's going on there. Maybe file a complaint. But usually it's it's pretty robust. And, and as you know, we've been using it for what, 20 years here? Maybe, seems like 20 years, if not. All right, any more? Well, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I should be back on track now that I'm in the new office, back on track with Week of Charts next week. That's going to be on Thursdays. On Wednesdays, I have my StockCharts.com show. It's only 30 minutes. goes by really, really quick. I know you guys probably know a lot about what I'm going to talk about there. But stop by if you get a chance. Uh, we had really good numbers on Wednesday. I was blown away with the number of attendees, and I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot of you guys that helped me out a little bit, and, I'm, and they're very excited to see that I'm bringing some people over there to uh, check it out. So check that out on Wednesdays. For members of daylander.com, I need to change my office hours, and I need to change when I'm going to do the Q&As. Also, my apologies for not getting the Q&A out for last week yet. I've just been slammed with the move and the stock chart show and everything else, but hopefully things will begin to settle down a little bit in here, not to mention the markets too. That's kind of a, a little bit of a distraction lately. Anyway, everybody enjoy your weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, thank you so much.